Hi, I'm Brett Slatkin, a software engineer here at Google. Uh, you're watching Google Developers Live. Today, we're with Dalton Caldwell, who's the uh, CEO and co-founder of App.net. And we're here in the App.net office in San Francisco. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the show here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming by. To fully disclose uh, my situation, I'm, I'm an App.net describer. I actually pay money to App.net every year uh, for the services you provide. So I know, I know the answer to a lot of the questions I'm going to be asking uh, during this. Uh, but I, I, you know, I want to start, start from the beginning. So tell me, what is App.net? App.net is a social platform. Um, you have an identity uh, as a user that you create. And once you have that identity created, um, you can log into a manner of, of different applications that have been built by third-party developers. OK, and so, so that's from the consumer side of things. Sure. Uh, what about as a, as a developer? You know, what, is, what is App.net for developers? Uh, App.net for developers is a, it's a social platform. So if you go look at our API documentation, it looks a lot like uh, what you've seen with other uh, social APIs, like a, like a Facebook or a Twitter. Um, additionally, there's, there's a bit more in terms of file persistence and, and uh, key value stores and things like that. So it's almost like a platform as a service. <laughs> okay. so, so call it a summation of a platform as a service and a social API. That, that's what it looks like to a developer. Gotcha. And how is it different than, than say, Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus and, and the APIs they provide? I mean, that's social infrastructure, too. They have login and messages and, and buttons and all that kind of stuff. What, what makes App.net different than what else is out there? We approach this um, from a conceptual perspective. Let me talk about that. Yeah. The issue with existing um, social infrastructure is they, those are all ad-supported services. And so um, the companies that provide those APIs are really focused on trying to get users um, in a situation where they can display ads and target ads, which is fair. It's a, it's a business. It's a good business. Quite, uh, that's, I guess that's Google's business. Um, and therefore, if you're a third-party developer, there's a number of encumbrances that you, that you tend to run up into. Um, if the eyeballs start going to your application that's using the data of that social platform, and so we don't need to enumerate all the ways <laughs> that, that you can kind of run into trouble. Um, the difference with App.net is it's made to look like infrastructure and feel like infrastructure. So the business model is a lot more like Dropbox or Evernote or GitHub, where it's freemium. There is a free tier for consumers, but um, there's a paid tier as well for, for consumer power users. And the idea here is that the more applications that third-party developers build, the more uh, attractive the platform is to consumers and the more likely we are to, to make more money. And therefore, we are uh, financially incentivized to have as many third-party apps built as possible, to identify as many niches as possible, uh, to expand the value of the platform, instead of, oh yeah, I guess we have an API. I hope people don't use it too much. <laughs> we want our first-party app, which is what's serving all the advertising, um, to be what people interface with. And so that's, from, from a, Business model perspective, that's what's different about it. And so it's caused us to make a number of different decisions in the API itself and in our relationship for how third parties integrate with it. That makes a lot of sense. Now, so that, that sounds like the value of app.net to a developer. Um, and so presumably, there's a bunch of developers using app.net to build their products. Uh, I thought maybe you could step us through or explain to us some of the, some of the apps out there that are building on top of app.net's uh, social API. Sure, so there's a number of different um, Verticals, I guess, is one way right. to think about it. Oh, but it. why don't we start with Passport, though? So sure, Passport's your app, yeah. So, yeah. What, so what is Passport, and what, is, what does Passport do for, for the user? Great. So, so we do have a first-party app. It's called Passport. Right now, it's live uh, on iOS and Android, both. And the advantage of Passport, if you have it installed, is you can do single sign-on to any app.net app on that platform, right? So if you're a third-party dev and you launch something new that's, um, that, that integrates with app.net, the user will be able to do single sign-on. Additionally, there's a directory of all of the applications on that platform, so users can easily discover your application if you integrate with us. Um, and so the, the user goes in, they can manage their account, they can change their settings, they can see what applications they can do single sign-on are, they can be prompted to download that application to the device, and then do single sign-on, bam, they're in. Um, so it's a really smooth user experience from users. And again, the idea of having this platform exist, uh, of having Passport exist, is to streamline the user experience for any third-party dev to build a new app. Gotcha. 
So, okay, so now I've installed Passport on my phone. Yeah. I go in there as a discovery platform. I look, I find a bunch of apps, I install them. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some of the apps that the users are using out there? Uh, you said verticals. Uh, so yeah, so one of them is, is microblogging. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's something like a, like a Twitter-like experience or a Facebook newsfeed experience where you, you put public status updates there and people can reply to them and all of that. Um, the most notable applications in that vertical, one of them is called Repost, R-I-P-O-S-T on iOS. Yeah. Um, there's also Felix, mm -hmm. uh, there's also NetBot. Those have all been featured by Apple, right? These wow. aren't just little toys. Really? These are <laughs> good enough for Apple editorial to, to, to feature them. Yeah. Um, on Android, um, I think Robin is definitely the most famous okay. uh, of those. Of the microblogging. Of the microblogging right. style services. Gotcha. Uh, so that's that vertical, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so the other ones were, I saw um, photo sharing was another vertical. Yeah, there's, there's photo sharing applications. Again, you can use the infrastructure to build a full photo only feed to post photos because we have file persistence. Um, the files that are updated are stored in the user's file bucket. So users can still own their own content. And so there's uh, uh, Climber and Sprinter on iOS side. Uh -huh. And I don't think there's a pure play Android uh, photo client yet. Not yet. But yeah. someone should build that. Someone should build that. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, and then the other thing, you know, strong part of app.net is kind of messaging and, and group messaging. So what are some of the apps that are doing that? From a developer's perspective, in addition to the public post API, that's what it's called, there's something called the um, channels slash messages API. And the, the idea from that is you can send private or non-private messages to a selected group of people rather than posting it to your feed. And from this, you can build um, what's basically uh, group messaging right. apps. So you know, imagine WhatsApp or Kick or something like that. Um, you can, any third party developer can use app.net's infrastructure to build their own group messaging application. And all of the back end is taken care of, and we actively embrace and want people to build these as opposed to having unofficial APIs, right. <laughs> which yeah. is different than some of those other services I just mentioned. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to build a, a new UI paradigm for doing group messaging or doing group photo messaging or, or you name it, um, people can do it. So the most popular in that vertical right now is something called Whisper mm -hmm. um, on iOS. And it's got stickers. <laughs> uh, it's got, yeah, like path, right? I mean, it's got, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got yeah. it's 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 a lot like path actually. Yeah. So it's got stickers. You can broadcast your location to friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do check-ins with friends uh, because we have a location API. And uh, and yeah, it interoperates with any other app.net app. So if an Android developer say wanted to build a group messaging application, anyone using Whisper would be able to talk to people using their application, wow. which is pretty cool. And That's so given cool. how popular group messaging is, I think there's a lot of opportunity for developers that want to that want to build group messaging applications. Great. So uh, let's move on. I think that you know, you've shown some examples of these great apps. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about the particulars of why developers choose to use app.net. Uh, I wanted to get into kind of the nitty gritty of the APIs sure. themselves. So you mentioned a little bit about channels and file persistence API, and that's great. Um, but you know, I think that as a developer, I'm, I'm considering using app.net. And when I when I you know when I think about that I say well what is it going to save me like what do I not have to do anymore if I if I choose to use app.net where am I starting you know why why what's the value that I get from from using your APIs sure well let's talk about it from the perspective of say uh, a client developer yeah. um, if you're an iOS or Android developer right out of the gate there's extremely high quality open source SDKs um, that wrap all of our uh, all of our infrastructure so you just drag that right into your respective uh, a text editor so yeah. you get Authentication, so it uses OAuth, um, so and also it'll you'll get the single sign-on from Passport. Right. So authentication is simple. Um, you get Social Graph, so once you have a user identity set up, follows, following, recommendations, all of that good stuff that you would get from a from a standard social API, you get right out of the box. Right. So you don't have the blank app problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty scary yeah. when you're a developer, and Definitely. you know maybe you get all the technical infrastructure working, but you have a blank database. That's not a <laughs> We've all been there, right? right? Yeah, this is the new app problem. You get a new app, you install it, you don't have any friends, you have to send them emails or something. It's and, pretty yeah. tough, right? Right. So as, as a developer, I spend all my time trying to just get people in the door as opposed to focusing on the actual experience that I want to exactly. provide to users, right? Exactly. That's, yeah. I think, and that's exactly the reason I think the world needs this kind of uh, infrastructure is that users should have the best apps that serve their needs and choose between those right. as opposed to, oh, this app has all the network effects, this one company even though their products aren't quite as good. And there's all these good, really talented designers or talented innovative UIs being built, but because they can't tap into the large user base, they're just gonna get squashed. I think that's a shame. I don't think it's good for users. Right. So, okay, so that's the, the libraries for iPhone. Um, you also have uh, a bunch of libraries for, for all the major languages that are out yes. there, I saw that. Uh, and then REST, like a RESTful API, yes. and the Cores API for JavaScript in the browser, so cross-domain. 
Um, in terms of like the nitty gritty uh, specifics, so you know, maybe I, I can rattle these off and you can tell me what each one of them does. So there's an account and authentication API. So we talked about passport and single sign on. Yes. I also saw there's like a two factor thing that you guys launched. Yeah, we have two factor auth. So yeah. without you, the developer, having to do anything, two factor auth on your app.net account just works. And right. it uses the standard uh, standards. So Google Authenticator, mm -hmm. like all the, the, what is it, OTA? What's the name of the standard? Uh, OTP, yeah. OTP, the, yeah, yeah. that just works. Right. So um, any user with an app.net account, if they want to turn on 2FA, they got it. Yeah, and that's that's important to me because I feel like I don't trust uh, other people with my passwords. I'm always like very worried about that. So if I, you know, when I install a new app, I'm thinking, okay, well, I have to make up a password for them because they probably aren't managing it correctly, yep. and that worries me a lot. And it's, so it seems like, just from a user's perspective, I like that more that I can trust, you know, maybe app.net in the same way that I trust Google with my with my single sign on. Correct. You know, that's that's great. But you guys are providing that. Right? Yeah. So yeah. the developer doesn't have to do anything, and two FA just works. Right. Um, uh, and then the other one I saw was uh, the user streams API. I think that's really interesting. What does that What does that do for developers? So there's the streaming API is quite powerful. Um, basically, you get you get callbacks when different events happen, and so you can get callbacks when things in the global stream happen. Um, for the user streaming API, you get callback events when something happens on a user's object. So um, if they star something, if they follow someone, right. if they if a channel that they're in, uh, so like a group chat. Right. Like if I'm if you're running a group tra chat client you can have it be very performant by actually getting streaming, streams back right. instead of having to pull for new messages. Right. And this is into the browser or into the clients? Or where, where do I get the user streams? You know? uh, it's, it depends on what library you're using. Okay. I mean, yeah. if you're using um, that iOS SDK, yeah. you got it. Oh, yeah. Like it's just <laughs> like push right down to the app. Yeah, you just, yeah. You, it works out of the box. One of the things that uh, most interests me about app.net that I want to talk about was uh, how you guys support open standards. and, and all the open formats. Uh, I was going to go through the list of all the things that you support because it's a laundry list, uh, which is really impressive. Uh, so RSS, uh, you know, really simple syndication feeds. Uh, activity streams, which are kind of a social version of that. Um, you support both the, I think, the XML and JSON versions of that, yep. which I think nobody else actually supports, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, PubSub Hubbub, which is something I worked on, which yep. makes uh, feeds real time, which is great. Uh, Webfinger for decentralized discovery. Uh, you have microformats built into all the different pages, uh, profile pages. Uh, you support media RSS and geo RSS. Uh, and then you also support indie auth uh, and the realme auth through uh, some of the link relations on, on the sites you have. So you, know, you can interoperate with all, you know, almost all the open standards that are out there that, that I've heard of that actually have any kind of usage. Uh, that's, that's awesome. But why did you do it? What's, what's the value in providing open standards uh, for app.net? users and developers. We're doing it because um, it's entirely consistent with why we're here, right? Uh, the goal of app.net is to be a really useful platform for users. And the more um, existing data, the more ways that it can interoperate with other things in their workflow, the more valuable we become to end users, um, as well as to developers. So just to be really concrete, on the RSS case, um, we built an open source thing called Pour Over that also supports Hub Sub Hubbub um, that made it really, really simple for any RSS feed to get ported into a post. Uh, to posts. Right. That was nice. We supported open standards. It was open source, so you can go find it on GitHub. But it also provided tremendous value for the users and developers of app.net because a whole lot of RSS feeds started pouring in, yeah. right? Um, which made the, the service more valuable for end users and for developers. And so we're doing it because it's consistent with our goal, uh, our goals, our mission, as well as our business model, which is, which is making um, going into the workflow as much as possible. And, and how does that contrast to some of the other companies out there that aren't supporting open standards? You know, I think we talk about them a lot, and, sure. but even like Twitter has reduced the, the number of RSS feeds. Google Plus still has no RSS feeds at all. You know, how, what's, I mean, the contrast there, it's, you know, it's in line with your principles, but at the end of the day, you know, why, why, shouldn't, you know, why isn't everyone adopting open standards like you are? I, I think it has to come down to um, business model motivations. Like I know many of the people that work at those other companies, and I respect them deeply and have learned a lot from them. And when you talk to them, especially behind closed doors, um, they would admit that it's difficult to make a business case for supporting many of these standards. Um, they're not necessarily widely adopted by their user base. And if you're, you know, if you have 100 million users and your business is to throw as many um, interruptive ads as you can at people inside of a first party client, it's really hard to make a business case for developing and supporting uh, those particular open standards, right? And in our case, we're not doing this again because we think it's going to be great um, to appeal to people and then in six months change our mind and deprecate all this stuff. This is really entirely consistent with our business value, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is just having as much content flow in and content flow out as possible um, to be pipes 
um, for more and more apps to get developed on it. And so I think it's the business case argument that really we can tie this stuff back to. Um, and I'd love to know if you agree or disagree with no, me. I just, that makes perfect sense to me. That's, I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I, like I said, I've talked to many people at those companies, and it's just it's very difficult to make a business case to, to senior management about why some of those standards are going to move the needle um, in a financial sense. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you recently celebrated a year of app.net, which is, so congratulations. It's great. Uh, so we've gone over a ton of features already that you know have uh, either been at launch or been launched you know since then. Uh, but what are you know what are some of the other things that have changed over the last year of app.net? Well, I think the most important thing from a consumer perspective is we added the free tier. We did not have a free tier at first because the service essentially didn't exist. <laughs> and so it was very rough. And we didn't want a lot of consumers to sign up for a service that's all about third-party apps with no third-party apps. That's, that's definitely the oxymoron of all time right there. Um, so we, we had enough develop. We gave developers the API. They built a bunch of stuff. Um, it's quite high quality, they iterated on it. Then we launched the free tier to start working on user distribution. Uh, additionally, we built out the channels API, the files API, many of the things we just mentioned were launched, you know, not at day one, but every month or two we added more and more things, right? right? Uh, and then finally, the most important thing we've been working on is out of the box experience and new user experience. Um, we realized that for this to be very valuable for developers, we need lots and lots and lots of users and we need to make it seamless so that if you build an app.net app, the users can sign up and create an account if they already have one without it being this complicated, laborious, painful process. Right. So we've been really optimizing our flows and our marketing and you know, the power of our engine to, to drive people to sign up um, so that the, the whole ecosystem can benefit from that. And so we've been spending, frankly, a lot of cycles on that out-of-the-box experience. That's why we built Passport, is we wanted to make it really simple and have a great experience for just normal users that aren't technical, they don't care about APIs, to still um, be like, oh, this someone launched a new group messaging app. I want to try this out. Oh, click, 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 they're in. Right? right? That's we've got to get that right for this to be successful. So we've been focusing on that a lot. Uh, the other one I saw that you that you launched uh, over the past year was the developer incentive. Oh, program. that's right. So what is the developer incentive? I mean, that sounds awesome. What is what is that? What is that? What does it mean? Uh, what do I what do I get? Sure. Well, the developer incentive program, we're paying out thirty thousand dollars per month. Uh, no strings attached, it's not an investment or anything, it's just it's just a check. <laughs> um, to the developers that build applications um, that provide the most value to users. And so the idea is that's a pool of money that goes out every month, and it gets sliced and diced to go to different developers in the incentive program, depending on how users rate their apps for how much utility they get from it. So you can't game the system, you can't show up and build some crappy port and right. throw it in the store and expect to, to make money from it. People have to actually use it and like it. But if you build something that people use and like, it means you're gonna have an income stream and we did this to help solve the cold start problem. Right. We know we're brand new. We know we aren't the size of some of these other platforms, but this gives you a huge leg up um, out of the gate to, to you know, uh, make this worth your while, worth a shot um, to, to build applications at stage. And frankly, it's worked quite well. What are you looking forward to in the next year of App.net? Sure, so we're really focusing on new user experience, out of the box experience, um, there's just over 160,000 users right now as we're recording this, which is a really solid place to be yeah. at, right? It's much bigger than a, than a lot of uh, companies make it. Um, but we're really focused on what it's going to take to get an order of magnitude more uh, usage out of the thing and uh, to take those channels. And so that's a really important piece. Additionally, developers, now that um, all the Hello World stuff has been built and now we have high-level APIs that have been built and there's all these verticals that have been populated, we're supporting developers that are building more rich, deep apps um, that, that are pushing the limits of what you can do with the social API. Because again, what I think that um, the benefit of our business model is, is that we want developers to push the limits of what you can do instead of the lowest common denominator. Um, like, you know, like when a startup right. is on its, they innovate, 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 and then when you get to a certain size, you kind of, most of your innovation is like new ad targeting and things. Yeah, you're like, this is good enough. <laughs> this, this works in our Let's ecosystem. Let's monetize. Let's monetize it, yeah. So now what we, what we want to see is that developers are using all of the basics that we have up and running and you can take that stuff for granted and start to push the limits of what kinds of social apps you can build, right? Like I never in a million years would have thought of Snapchat, right? Would you? Like yeah. it's not something, but someone did and clearly there was big demand for it. So we want to see, us we want to see developers coming up with mixes and mashes for all of the it's like Taco Bell, you know, you have like five ingredients, you can make lots of things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully it's more tasty than that, yeah. Yeah, so, so like, 
we have all the, the Lego building blocks, and so we want to support developers that want to push the limits of what they can do with it. And I'm really excited. This, I've seen stuff that I, it's even hard to describe in terms of personal and journaling, app, journaling apps that the developers are starting to build um, that does not neatly fit into an existing vertical. And that's really exciting to me. Yeah, that's interesting. So the, the API has kind of en enabled them to build things that didn't exist before Right, because you're all. starting at this level. Yeah. You're not starting down here like, oh, it took me a month of developing just to get sign in. Yeah, right? Like it's, you, you can, all this stuff works out of the box. So you can really focus on taking advantage of, okay, I have a social graph, I have a user base, I have a file storage API, um, I have geolocation. It just works. So how can I glue this stuff together to make really compelling user experiences? And I think that's what this era of apps are about, is that the app store is the gold rush is over. If developers want to learn more, they can go to developers.app.net. And uh, because this is a social service, we're all on it, so we're easy to talk to. If you want to ask me a question directly, my username on app.net is Dalton, D-A-L-T-O-N, and I'd love to hear from you. That's all the time we have today. Uh, thanks for joining us with app.net, and we'll see you next time.